There's Barb. Morning, Barb. And I think I said good morning, Karen. I hope so. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> good morning. Hello, alternate area A. <laughs> Good morning. One minute for Jackie. Jackie's never late. Okay, good morning. I did send Jackie a text to remind her and that doesn't mean we can't get started. We have a quorum here. Morning, everyone. Hi, Barb. And uh, we will, uh, oh, I think the corporate officer has to call the meeting to order and then we elect chair, vice chair. Please go ahead, Melanie, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Director Birch Jones. Uh, we're, gonna, we're just waiting for confirmation of the live stream. And once we have that, then uh, then Christian will be signing off and I'll be able to call the meeting to order. Got it. And there's Jackie. Just under the wire, Jackie, good morning. <laughs> okay, and we have a confirmation that the live stream is now running. So um, I can call the meeting to order. So uh, we will call the meeting of the Northern Economic Development Initiative Committee meeting to order for February 3rd, 2022. Um, I would like to recognize that collectively we're on the unceded territories of all the First Nations within our regional boundaries. And we will start with the election of the chair for 2022. So I'll call for nominations for the 2022 Chair of the Northern Economic Development Initiatives Committee. Director DeMare? I'd like to nominate Vivian Birch-Jones as the chair. Thank you, I accept. Okay, do we have a seconder? Director Playfair. Thank you. Um, so I would like to call a second time for nominations for the chair. Okay, and I'll call a third time for nominations for the chair. There being none, 
I would like to congratulate Director Birch Jones. You are now the chair of the Northern Economic Development Initiatives Committee for 2022. And at this time, I will uh, turn the chair over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, CAO Helmer. So I will call for nominations for the vice chair for the NETIC committee, please. I would like to nominate Sal DeMare. I'd second that. I was trying to turn on my mic. <laughs> <laughs> I accept. Okay, moved and seconded. And Director DeMare is accepted. So I need to call for nominations a second time for vice chair. Are there other nominations? And I'll call a third time. And um, seeing none, thank you, Sal. Congratulations, you're the vice chair. And the first item now, number two on our agenda is approval of the agenda. Could I have a motion to that effect? Moved by Director DeMare, seconded by Director Playfair. Thank you. Now. We have delegations. I don't know if they're sitting in the waiting room. Um, uh, yes, they I'm are, not, Chair. I'm not seeing Jackie here. Did we lose her? Uh, yes, and she's reappeared in the waiting room. I'll readmit her as well as, uh, if you are ready, Chair, I can admit Steve Kazuki. Thank you very much. Welcome back, Jackie. <laughs> I'm glad you're here because I'd be particularly interested in, in this presentation. And welcome, Steve Kozuki. Do I have that right? Uh, I'm Vivian Birch Jones, and I'd like to just invite you to go ahead and do your presentation. I'm sure we have somebody doing the screen sharing to look through your presentation. Okay, you're doing it, great. I'll turn the floor over to you, Steve. Mr. Kazuki, you need to unmute for starters. <laughs> I'm so sorry. You would think after all this time that we would have this technology figured out. Um, thank you all so much for having me here. Uh, delighted to share some information with you around the Forest Enhancement Program, um, what we are and what we do and how we help people in, in your local areas do good work in forests. So, um, <clears throat> Just my title slide here, you can see that there's a, this, this area was all burned in the uh, 2017 mega fires just west of Williams Lake on the Chilcotin Plateau. And I'm holding in my hand uh, a small baby seedling. And it represents the, the juxtaposition of a, a really big old growth tree that was killed by the wildfire with a new seedling. And uh, so it signifies rebirth, rejuvenation and renewal. So uh, just so you know who I am and, and to see you have some context, uh, I'm a forester. Um, I live in Williams Lake. I've worked for quite a variety of employers from forest consulting to being self-employed, uh, a large integrated forest company in British Columbia, a trade association called uh, COFI or the Council of Forest Industries, a pulp mill. I've worked for government as a BC timber sales manager for the Caribou Chilcotin and I was also the director of timber pricing uh, for the Ministry of Forests in Victoria and that's stumpage, uh, cruising, scaling and, and waste policies uh, throughout the province and now I have the pleasure of being with the Forest Enhancement Society of British Columbia. Um, 
So what we do, I'll, I'll tell you what the outcomes of what we do, and that, that might help you to better understand what FAS is. So we, we're taking action on climate change and we're helping BC and Canada meet our climate change targets. And under the, the Paris Agreement, which is like an international treaty where all of the signing signatory countries have agreed that they, there should be action taken to mitigate climate change. And, um, and in accordance with those international carbon accounting standards, forestry is recognized as a tool to help with that. And first of all, by, by planting trees, uh, growing trees, just like you and me, uh, people, human beings, animals, almost all life on earth, we're carbon-based. So as we grow and get bigger, we're accumulating carbon inside of our bodies. And that carbon stays in our bodies until we die or decompose, or in the case of forests, uh, maybe get burned up. And uh, at that time, uh, that carbon is li liberated back into the atmosphere. Um, so because trees absorb carbon from the atmosphere as they're growing, uh, the second way that the, the international community recognizes forests as being an important part of the, the climate change solution is fertilization. Because if we can make trees grow faster, then they absorb carbon faster from the atmosphere. And the third way is to avoid emissions from that carbon that's embodied in the wood, in the, in the trees, in the forests. And so when there's a forest fire, like I, I think they said that in 2017, the, all the forest fires in British Columbia that year, the carbon emissions from those forest fires was equal to all of the provincial emissions for five years. And, and that was all in one, one summer. So that's pretty exciting. And, and the reason why it's exciting is that forestry in British Columbia is such a powerful tool yeah, we can electrify our, our vehicle fleets. We can improve our building codes to reduce our energy consumption. But forestry is a really, really big uh, part of that equation. And we, we don't really have a very good chance of meeting our climate change targets here in BC or Canada, unless forestry is part of that. And, and the good news is, is that it is. There is another way, um, it's not, although it's not recognized so much, it is in some building codes, green building codes, and that the, the carbon that's in wood, in your, in your house, in your doors, and maybe in your desk, um, that carbon is stored and it's not decaying and it's not burning up. And so when we, the, the, the carbon, the wood in the wood in my house is storing that carbon for, you know, maybe a hundred years, who knows? Uh, another thing that FEST does is we help communities, uh, large, small, Indigenous, non-Indigenous, all around the province, to help reduce wildfire risk. Uh, in fact, Dr. Lori Daniels, uh, professor of forestry at UBC, said that the, that the treatment that we had funded uh, near Logan Lake may very well have saved, helped to save that town. And so you can see in this photo here, um, the, the before picture is a very thick, crowded forest. And throughout the interior and probably, you know, around Lillooet, we have a lot of that. Uh, because of decades of fire suppression, nor what you need to understand is that normally in a landscape, uh, in the drier interior parts, and even some of the, the coastal parts, fire is a frequent visitor. Every 8, 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 years, Nature will bring a fire in to rejuvenate the area, improve the wildlife habitat, to thin out the trees and reduce the amount of woody biomass that, that, that burns. And when you have frequent fires that go through quite every few years, that woody biomass doesn't build up. Um, but because we've been putting the fire out uh, and we've been very, very good at that, especially after the Second World War, and that's when the whole Smokey the Bear, some of you might remember that, uh, you know, fire is bad and, and it's evil and it kills people and, and we should put it out. Unfortunately, what we didn't realize at the time was that we were excluding an essential uh, ecological force in our forests and many animals and plants and, and the whole ecology of the system was evolved and depends on 
on that fire being an important part of that ecosystem maintenance. And because we stopped that, it's allowed many forests to overgrow. Here's another anecdote. Uh, you know, one of the chiefs uh, of the Okanagan Nation Alliance, one of the projects we funded was to thin out some forests around Penticton. And one of the problems was that the bighorn sheep, um, the, the populations were under extreme stress because the sheep, unlike mule deer, they like the sheep like to see their, their prey or their predators from a distance. And because the forest had grown in, they couldn't see very far. And that created stress, lower birth rates, uh, lower birth weights as well. And, and the population was in decline. So by reopening the forest and creating more natural, natural conditions, the bighorn sheep were allowed to, to thrive. And that's just one of many examples of the, the problems that are starting, we're starting to see because of decades of fire suppression. So we're very proud that we've funded over 120 uh, projects all around the province to help protect communities. We often like, like in the case of Williams Lake where I live, not only are we doing these treatments to reduce the fire risk, but we're capitalizing on the opportunity to improve mountain biking trails, uh, improve mule deer habitat, open things up and, and help to restore the natural ecological functioning of these areas. And people say they like the way it looks after it's thinned out. And it certainly is, is a much more natural. Um, another big thing, again, on the carbon climate change file is um, using wood that otherwise would be wasted. Um, if any of you have seen logging operations, commercial industrial logging, you know that there's wood that they can't use. So the, by law, they're required to dispose of that fire hazard. So they pile it up. Uh, on the landing or beside the road and then every fall go around and burn that and we've been doing that for years but the emissions from the open burning is is quite um, potent because it's not just carbon dioxide when you're like when you have a campfire or a slash burn um, it's it's not only carbon but it's also nitrous oxide and methane and those are very powerful potent greenhouse gases uh, nitrous oxide for example is 297 times more potent than just plain old carbon dioxide in terms of the greenhouse gas uh, effect. And so what we've done, we, we figured out the trick of how to give just a little bit of funding to make some of this wood that otherwise would have been slash burned to help to get it used. And it's used to make pulp products, which, you know, personal hygiene, paper straws, cardboard boxes that we all get from Amazon or, or online shopping. And, or in many communities, we have cogen facilities like Merritt and, and, and so many other places around the, the province where we're turning this wood waste into electricity. And we use that electricity in our homes and our businesses, or if we have more than what we need, we can export it to Alberta and California, which is important because those are two jurisdictions that get a lot of their electricity from fossil fuels. And uh, another product is we can make pellets. And when you pelletize the wood, it makes it easy to transport in ships all around the world. And when we do that, it often displaces coal, which is a very dirty fossil fuel, uh, particularly in, in Japan or um, China or Europe, especially Great Britain. So that's the type of project that we, we really enjoy. Um, it's also it created a lot of jobs and economic opportunities, especially when there's downturns in the forest sector. So just to give you a visual of what I'm talking about, uh, wood waste, uh, you see obviously the picture on the left, the big piles that are ready for slash burning. But in the nick of time, before they were actually burned, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the First Nation in Williams Lake applied for funding and we gave it to them. And then they went in there with a the machine that ground up all those that those waste piles and they took it to the cogen plant in Williams Lake and made electricity. Now some of this, about one third of these piles actually went into pellets as well, which is another uh, green fuel. So I mentioned First Nations. Yeah, 30% of our funding has gone to First Nations. And that's not a surprise because, you know, they, they live on the land, they have for thousands of years, they, they have been wanting to participate in the forest economy for a long time, but they haven't really had uh, opportunities. Well, our funding has been a catalyst for them to, 
either get involved in, in forestry businesses or move up the forest management ladder. And by that, what I mean is, you know, for many years, we've had crews uh, of, you know, manual laborers from First Nations communities. And that's great. That's a job, but it's not really managing the forest. And when we allow the opportunity for Indigenous people to actually be leaders on projects and making decisions about what's going to happen where, and it, it, it's really uh, quite transformational and powerful. One chief told me, he said, you know, it's a lot more than just a job for the young men and women in his community, you know, doing these projects. It uh, builds up self-esteem and it creates social benefits that I hadn't realized. When I went to forestry school, I had no idea how much, uh, how powerful we, of an impact we can have on people's lives. He said that it's reduced uh, uh, petty crime, domestic violence, uh, substance abuse is down. And uh, he thinks that even the children are doing better academically in school. So that, that's, that's pretty important to us. Uh, we're all over the place, as you can see on this map. And um, I just took a look at our database to see what projects we had in your regional district. Um, and there's some good ones. Uh, Arrow transportation out of Kamloops. They're using some of that waste wood in, in logging operations. And they're, they're taking it uh, from Lillooet over to Kamloops. And they're using that. Some of it's used to make pulp and paper, but most of it is used as what's called hog fuel. And they, they incinerate it at a high temperature. So it's a clean burn. And they're making energy, thermal and electrical energy that they use to help power their pulp mill process. And sometimes they produce a surplus of power and that electricity goes back into the electrical grid. Uh, we have your local First Nation, um, I don't know how to say it, Zalap Community Forest. Uh, we fund a lot of community forests all around British Columbia. There's, there's one in, in your area. And they wanted to reduce wildfire risk to protect the community and at the same time improve uh, wildlife habitat. Um, there was a project to look at old growth structure and carbon sequestration. So it helps to all of us understand, you know, what, how old growth is beneficial to us. And so that was an interesting project. Uh, Squamish, uh, they uh, thinned out some forest um, to create what's called a shaded fuel break. So if you think of a fire garden, you want to protect a community or a residential development, you, you might think, oh, well, we'd want, uh, you know, a bladed trail of bare mineral soil that's unburnable. But uh, quite often, uh, most prescribers, we've seen it a lot, they, they would rather have, and the citizens would rather have a shaded fuel break, which means that there's some trees remaining, they provide some shade, it increases the humidity, and the idea isn't to prevent the fire, um, but it sure slows it down and it gives crews, the, the firefighters, a, a safe place to to stage their activities or maybe do a backburn, like in the case of Logan Lake that I talked about earlier. And we have Chequemus as well. Um, they, they also wanted to reduce some wildfire risk. So I wanna thank you, um, maybe not you individually directly, but uh, thank the whole regional district because you have some really talented, knowledgeable folks in your area. And that's our funding model. Uh, forest enhancement, we don't actually do anything we rely on local experts in, in your area to come forward and propose projects that they know because of their local knowledge uh, will will meet the needs and, and, and create benefits in, in your region. And so they've stepped forward. They've applied for projects. We've uh, funded so far to date $2.2 million, uh, of which $2.1 million is completed work. And so we like to plant more trees on areas that uh, otherwise wouldn't be reforested. We want to accelerate the expansion of the bioenergy sector in British Columbia. And we want to help protect communities from further wildfire risk and, um, and certainly uh, involve indigenous people where possible. So fairly quick overview, and um, hopefully that gives you a sense of what we do, what we are, our model. We were created by the British Columbia government. And so we're a crown entity. Uh, we're not as big as ICBC or ferries or, or lotteries or anything like that. I only have six staff, including myself. So we're very small, but 
as I say, we don't actually do work. We just administrate the funds and uh, direct them in, in, a, in, in ways that we think make a lot of sense and provide a lot of benefits for British Columbians. So if there's time, I'd be delighted to have a conversation or answer any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Steve Kazuki. Um, if you would stop sharing your screen, I'd be grateful just because that means I can, I can see everyone if people have questions. Thank you. Um, this is really brilliant work. We want to do all of it. And, you know, of course, that's why we invited you today, because we have <laughs> so much potential for some of these projects. I have a couple of ideas, but I see Director DeMare's hand up. Go ahead. And also Barb Weave. Thank you. Start with Sal and Jackie. Okay, got it. <laughs> Thank you, Director Bert Jones. Uh, Steve, you may have remembered me. I lived in Williams Lake for about 28, 29 years back in the days. And uh, I remember when the cogent plant went in and, and, and uh, yeah, that was a huge improvement for that community. I've got one question though on the, uh, Aero transportation, 100,000 cubic meters. Was that the First Nations that went down the Bridge River and took all the pulpwood out? I don't specifically know, but if it's important, I can find out for you, Sal. Yeah, there was. You know, it was. It was a good project because they went in and and there was a whole area of dead pine trees at the far end of the Downton Reservoir along the Bridge River. And uh, there were a lot of truckloads that went out and it was I, all fault. Yeah, I would pretty, with a high degree of certainty, I would guess that the answer is yes. Uh, the little bit that I know about Lillooet, it, it can be very challenging forestry wise, uh, economically steep, difficult terrain um, with interior, lower quality interior uh, forests uh, a lot of times. So, and the, the economic circle for a pulp mill or a pellet plant or a cogen facility is not very wide. Uh, sometimes it's a 50 kilometer radius or 100, depending on the exact circumstances. But yeah, trying to bring waste wood from Lillooet into Kamloops would definitely need some financial assistance from our organization. Yeah, the, the area was roughly uh, in kilometer wise from Lillooet. So it's straight west of Lillooet roughly 100 and 140 kilometers. So it's definitely a long haul to, to Kamloops, but it was done. And I, and I do believe it all went to the, you know, a good portion of it went to the uh, pulp mill. I, I do know, I, I don't know Bridge River, unfortunately I've never been there, but uh, I, I do know of other communities where citizens are, one of the things they appreciate the most is, is less smoke in the air. <clears throat> Yeah, yes, for sure. Yeah, and, uh, you know, in your second from last slide, there was, you know, when we, because, you know, I've, I've been following FE, FESBC, and Dave, I used to work with Dave Connolly. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so that it, you know, when I started looking at some of the projects that were done, specifically with parks and recreation sites, that's, when the idea came up of the uh, Brayland Recreation Area, which is the uh, uh, the Bridge River Valley Community Association, Association had a section 56 with it in part in partnership with the Oyston First Nations. So, yeah, I would still like to talk talk to you about that one. Thank you, Vice Chair Sal. <laughs> I think Barb Weave, you are next on my list, my speakers list. Great. <laughs> I, I made a speaker's list. Um, in layman terms, meaning for, I don't know, maybe there's um, a book on, there's so many books on explaining things. Can you kind of in the English language explain how a cogen plant works? Please. Yeah. Well, everybody's familiar with... Uh, campfires or wood stoves or a fireplace and and so you can burn the wood uh release the energy and and you can feel the heat from that and that's 
basically what a cogen facility does, except it does it in, um, in a way that is very clean burning. I think it's around 850 degrees Fahrenheit is the optimal burn temperature. And they use that heat to typically they'll, they'll heat, make hot water and steam. So it's a really old technology. Uh, and that steam will turn a turbine. And so this big wheel spins around and around. And that is by a shaft connected to an electrical generator, which is the opposite of electric motor. You know, if you flip a switch, an electric motor spins around like your vacuum cleaner. Well, it does the opposite. It takes physical motion and then generates electricity from that. Hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Um, I absolutely love the reduction in waste that, that you're referring to. Jackie, your hands up. I see you. Go ahead. Please. Thanks. Um, so Steve, I come from a not-for-profit background and wondered about uh, funding and finances. Um, can you explain to me how the forest ecosystem um, program gets its funding and the you know sustainability of this program and, and things even going into the future? We have received two tranches of funding, um, bulk funding uh, five years ago, uh, $85 million. And then that was followed by four years ago with $150 million. And then three million last year for a total of two hundred and thirty-eight million dollars, which is a, a good sized chunk of money to make a meaningful difference. And uh, but it's just at the will of the provincial government from year to year. And uh, unfortunately, we're we're in a situation now where we fully allocated all the funding that we have, and uh, in the absence of funding replenishment, we're going to have to wind down. I don't know the answer to that um, because it, it's a decision by Treasury Board at the provincial level. So ideally, I think in the future, and what I'm gunning for is a permanent stable stream of funding so that we can do this forever and ever. A couple of examples that I look to are the hotel motel uh, tax. There's a bit of a surcharge, I think it's 2%. And it's voluntary. It, it, but, but by the, the hospitality industry. And that tax is collected by the government and then given back to Destination BC to do tourism promotion. Uh, another example is whenever you buy a hunting or a fishing license or guiding or trapping, there's a conservation surcharge. And um, that's been in place for years and that's collected by the government, but it's legislatively protected in the sense that the government must collect it and then the government must give it to the Habitat Conservation Trust Foundation, who is an ally of FAS. Um, and then they use that to fund habitat improvement projects for wildlife around the province. And so those are the funding models that, that I like, um, but we're not there yet. Okay, thank you. I just wondered about um... Yeah, the sustainability of the program. Lots of times these are great for a little while, but um, just wondering about that. So that gives, it sounds like you have some money going into the future, but it's not stable long-term at this point, but you are advocating for models to change into that, which is, um, which is necessary, especially with climate change. It's just gonna keep happening. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Um, and Karen, I see your hand up, but first I have Lori Hopful. Go ahead. Yeah, so um, thank you for that presentation. That was that was a really good presentation. And further to that, like I'm working on different projects, and I am just wondering if you're okay with contact uh, outside of this meeting and to talk about other projects because I can go on and on. So uh, if that would be okay, if you could leave your email or pick up my email, I'd like to talk to you further about your, your um, projects. Absolutely, Lori. Uh, probably the easiest and most convenient, just uh, fesbc.ca. Oh, well, that is easy. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And um, you know, there, there's information there about a program um, and, and I would be delighted to, you know, hear about your, your proposal. 
we love to have an inventory of unfunded proposals that are ready to go. Because with the nature of our funding, you never know when you, we might get some end of year funding and it has to be spent real fast. So if we have shovel ready projects. The other benefit of having this inventory of unfunded projects is it demonstrates that there's a need and a desire from local communities. And I'll just touch on that for a moment, the, who eligible applicants are. So as your, your mind is turning around uh, what projects you have in mind or, or you know some people who could come forward and, and propose projects, well, it's just about anyone uh, from an Indigenous company, an Indigenous government. We even have regional districts, although most don't because they don't want to expose themselves to financial liability. So they'd rather keep some distance from, from the actual project. So they will um, hire a forest consultant who is paid for through the funding projects of the projects. And then the fund, the, the consultant will act on behalf of the regional district or municipalities uh, in some cases like the city of Cornell. Um, a lot of community forests uh, could be forest companies themselves or uh, suppliers like aerial transportation. So almost anyone can, can apply. And even individuals, if they, you know, if they have the capacity to do that. Okay, thank you. And I'll be in contact. Okay, so Steve, that was fesbc.ca, simple Correct. as that. Yeah. And, um, yes, I'm also thinking about, I mean, obviously after the McKay fire and so forth, and I've had some very good suggestions about having a fire zone around Lillooet, which of course isn't too much to do with my area, which is area B, but nevertheless, it's a very good idea, especially if it's something like what you did in Logan Lake, and I've seen those results. Good for you guys. Uh, Karen, please go ahead. Um, yeah, I was sort of following up on what Jackie was asking about with regard to funding, and it's, it's a bit discouraging to hear that your funding may end. I guess I, part of me is wondering why this is the cost of this isn't going back to forest industry, you know, for-profit organizations that are making money from, from logging, et cetera. But all that aside, um, I wondered if there was something you thought that local governments could be doing with regard to advocacy on this to, you know, say, hey, we think this is a great thing. Um, let's keep it funded. You know, a number of mayors and, uh, and, and, and regional district directors uh, have spoken up. I don't advocate for that. I don't counsel anyone to, to do that. We're an agent of the crown, so we can't advocate for ourselves even. And we certainly wouldn't want to, what do you call it, <laughs> encourage or, or foster, uh, you know, political engagement by any, you know, I, I can't, I won't make that suggestion to you. You have to decide if it's important for you and um, you know maybe speak to others in your uh, regional district associations or through UBCM and maybe there's a coalition of, of communities that, that see value and, and want to, you know, it, it really, you know, it doesn't have to be fast. I mean, we, it, it could be the provincial government. We've had the Ministry of Forests forever, you know, they could do that and there's many other ministries. So. This work that, that's being done, um, it doesn't really matter who does it. Uh, what, what matters is that it's, it, there's a funding source and there's continuity and that there's a, a guiding mind, you know, what the objectives are around. So the drivers for us, as you know, are climate change and all the other stuff. Um, you know, we're just an administrator and I, I think we're a good one. Our overhead is 6% overall. And uh, if you know anything about funding programs, anything less than 10 or 12% is amazing. And so we think we provide great value for, for the, the use of taxpayers' money. We're not industry, we're not government, uh, we're apolitical. So that objectivity, I think is a real tremendous benefit especially when it comes to working with Indigenous people, because a lot of times they don't want to work with the provincial government because there's a lot of baggage, you know, it's hard for them to have a conversation with the provincial government without getting tangled up in the rights and title and 
and and all of that treaty stuff. So when when we work with them, it's just about the project. So there's a there's a lot of things that I think why FAST is well suited to administer these 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 funds. Um, we probably number one is just our whole philosophy. We're our objective is to help you be successful. We want you to get to, we want to put money into your hands. And so that might be a contrast to some other funding programs that you may have experienced in the past. So if you think, if you like what you see, then yeah, by all means speak up, but I'm, I'm not gonna make that suggestion. Well, I certainly like what we see and I really appreciate your work and, and what you've done. And thank you very much for this time today. We have another presenter waiting in the wings, so I'm going to bid you adieu with oh. sincere thanks. Well, thank you for your interest and, and your support. Uh, it's really appreciated. And I hope to hear from you soon about your great ideas on how we can do more projects in your area. Perfect. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. And now we'll just wait for our next presenter. To be led in, Suzanne Denbeck, Principal of Cadence Strategies. Thank you, Chair. Admitting her now. Welcome, Suzanne Denbeck. Good morning. Vivian here. I think you probably know everyone on the netic committee i believe uh, i do so there's some new staff faces but uh, there are we've got alba here she's a new staff person with the slrd we're glad to have her but please just go ahead with your presentation i'm already running late <laughs> yes um thank you for the opportunity to share i was asked to give netic an update more specifically on the work that's been undertaken for the district of lillooet uh, my last presentation was focused uh, more on area a and the bridge river valley so let me just take you through that um can we go to the next slide please so when we began this work uh, in the district of Lillooet and secured the funding through NDIT for uh, economic development capacity building, uh, it was uh, early in 2020. And of course, COVID uh, had just been announced as a global pandemic. So we started that process uh, sort of in three phases. The first thing was just to gather and share information and understand the current reality, uh, the impacts of COVID, the opportunities share the, the many resources and supports that were you know, literally being announced daily and look at some better practices to bring to the District of Lillooet. Uh, and then the next phase in 2020, I'll just go through this quickly because it provides some context then for the work that we've done in 2021. Um, there were some immediate opportunities and that we activated in 2020 specific to tourism as travel opened up around the province. But we also knew that we had to plan for longer term resiliency uh, and that that was going to require you know, some engagement with the citizens of Lillooet, some learning and then some prioritizing. So we go to the next slide. Um, this is the, you know, the gather and share information. Again, I think you're familiar with this. We did a lot of work. Uh, surveying and talking to the local businesses. Uh, the chamber was active at that point. It went quiet for a bit and happily it's uh, very active again. Uh, the Lillooet and District Historical Society, Miyazaki House, Tourism Lillooet, um, worked with the chamber and the district staff to distribute information on the programming and started to update the district website with all those resources and links. Go to the next slide. And then looked at a lot of better practices about safe and responsible travel and what visitor centers were doing by local programs, um, you know, helped in both years, worked with the, the historical society to uh, have some form of visitor information available. We touched base with our residents to make sure as we started to promote Lillooet again as a travel destination that there was a willingness to receive travelers from around the province. Um, you know, closer 
within the BC borders at any rate, um, that was considered acceptable by most residents, um, not farther afield at that point in time. And as we started to look towards our um, longer term strategies, we formed an economic development advisory committee, launched a business survey uh, to look at the impacts and the opportunities. And also, um, you know, understanding how our collective future is, you know, very much interdependent with the Statlium communities and our neighbors and, you know, a real desire to work collaboratively with them uh, began to launch a series of regular, we're hoping there were regular quarterly meetings. It was a little bit spotty, to be honest, just because of schedule and timing and COVID and wildfires, but that, um, that is also in place. Uh, and we have another meeting uh, this is a bit of an impromptu one coming up in February and a more formal one we do quarterly. So the next one will be in March. Go to the next slide, please. Um, some of the immediate threats and opportunities were around tourism. I think you all know that um, we launched the new website with the support of the district. And I think one of our challenges now in 2021 and going forward is uh, finding the funding to maintain that website and be active on the social channels. We all know that uh, you know, social channels are only as good as today's content. So uh, it's not enough to simply have a good website and to have social channels, you need to be populating them with interesting content. So that's part of, you'll see the, the work that we're considering uh, in 2022 is how we generate sustainable funding for tourism Willowet. Go to the next slide. Um, yeah, we, you've seen this, uh, I'm, I hope you've all been on visitlillowet.ca. Um, it's a very nice website, but again, um, Honestly, it's uh, already getting a bit stale. So there is a need, as there always is, to continue to make investments in that. Uh, next slide. And just wanted to note, um, we worked with uh, the Statlium. Christina Ledoux is on the board of Tourism Lillooet. And so there is you know, very clear recognition, um, always being very cognizant of you know, being respectful and acknowledging uh, unceded territory, uh, and we continue to do that in, in all of our efforts. Next slide. So the plan for long-term resiliency, um, that began in 2020 with the establishment of the Economic Development Advisory Committee, and then through 2021, we continued to meet. Uh, so if you could go, that's the composition. We tried to get sort of representation from small business, from retail, uh, the bigger players like BC Hydro, uh, tourism, of course, LAFS is on there for agriculture. Uh, Kim North is representing a lot of the not-for-profits and the, the hub. And then we've got uh, Saul Terry is one of the artists and Florence Jack from Hoiston. So I'm um, trying to really get a broad representation. We'll go to the next slide. So over the course of 2021, um, you know, we really tried to inform ourselves. We had an OCP update. We talked about downtown revitalization, uh, the innovation hub concept, a discussion of priorities and opportunities. And part of our 2021 work plan was to identify three priority sectors for uh, business attraction. We recognize that there is a business retention opportunity as well that we need to work with the businesses that we have in Lillooet and make sure that we keep them or if they are indeed planning to retire or sell or move on that we're supporting that process so that we support the sale and a new owner rather than a vacant storefront uh, or a lost service to the community but specifically with uh, business attraction we thought in 2021 that we would identify three seg sectors and create some pieces to, to speak to those sectors. But working with the Economic Development Advisory Committee, we actually found, we, we challenged ourselves to identify those sectors and realized that we needed more community input before we could do that appropriately. That in many respects, Lillooet um, is in a position of writing its own story for its economic future. It's at a bit of a crossroads. And so that led to a community survey uh, that actually received some really great engagement. We had good take up on that survey, uh, tip of the hat to uh, the innovation hub there on Main Street, 
Uh, they helped get it out at the farmer's market. They helped get it out with artists that were displaying their work. Uh, so we have a, a good survey base now from the community members of all ages, um, all lengths of residency in Lillooet. So some new folks to Lillooet, some longer term folks that have been here 20 plus years. And so that allowed us then to develop a framework in just at the end of 2021, that's going to provide direction for the next one to three years. And I'll be sharing the more specific results of that survey and that framework with the district mayor and council next week at a committee of the whole meeting on February 8th. So if we could go to uh, the next slide. Um, the opportunities then, so knowing that we have a framework going forward, um, of course, within that are some of the opportunities that we had identified earlier, as well as now, um, we believe we're able to identify the top three sectors that residents of Lillooet themselves has said, this is what we see as our economic future. Uh, and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't limited to the district boundaries. We had uh, input from the Satlium communities from area B. Uh, it was a survey that was open to all. Uh, but part of what we're, we're continuing to do is uh, work with the Statlium communities, as I mentioned, with the quarterly meetings, uh, exploring programs to support business retention and succession planning for those business owners that are you know, perhaps at retirement age and looking to move on. And then on the topic that I mentioned earlier with sustainable funding for tourism, Lillooet, we've initiated a process with our, our partners in the Range Beyond Range campaign. So that was uh, the Bridge River Valley Community Association, their Economic Development Committee in Area A and uh, Tourism Pemberton for the Village of Pemberton and Area C. And then Tourism Lillooet, of course, representing District of Lillooet and Area B. Uh, so as a collective, we had, you'll recall, launched the Range Beyond Range uh, Circle Tour, which will continue in 2022 and hopefully expand um, as more Statlium experiences open. Uh, Christina Ledoux, I had a call with her the other day and they are hoping to open Hoiston Experience Tours for summer 2022. So of course, if they, they open, we absolutely want to include them in that circle tour. Um, but because we, you know, we tested the waters in 2021 of working in this kind of triumvirate at the southern end of, you know, officially we are in the Caribou Chilcotin Coast tourism region, although in many respects we, we relate more to Sea to Sky and the lower mainland. So we're having some early discussions about uh, the 3% municipal regional district tax. And if we would like to uh, approach that independently of the Caribou Chilcotin Coast Tourism Association and form our own catchment uh, with the, the sort of this triumvirate. So Village of Pemberton, District of Lillooet and areas A, B and C of the SLRD, but very, very early discussions. There are pros and cons to doing this uh, and we're just starting to explore that now. And of course, um, then we would um, want to coordinate with the Triple CTA because they are also in the process of trying to renew for the next five years. So we don't want to create any confusion. We need to be sure um, that everyone, as we, it, only one party should ap approach accommodators for petition signatures. So we need to figure out who that's going to be for the next MRDT cycle. Uh, could we go to the, sorry, I was like, I haven't got my son to school yet. So that's why I was anxiously waiting in the, in the uh, waiting room for you guys. Um, we could go to the next slide. Can we go to the next slide? I beg your pardon. I'm just having technical <laughs> little technical challenge there. <laughs> Do you want me to share my screen and then I can just do it for my copy? Shall I share my screen? You can just give me one minute, that'll be great. 
And just so you know, Suzanne, we, we did all receive this presentation okay. in our package ahead of time. Okay. Um, there we go. So next slide, please. Okay. Nope, not yet. Oh, there we go. Okay, so again, some of this you're familiar with already. We, uh, a part of our successes were the, the grant for the campground. Uh, it was the largest tourism dependent communities grant in the province. And uh, now the district, it's owned by the district and they have a long-term operating agreement with Sekolash and are working with Antares to uh, activate those improvements to the campground with that um, near $1 million grant. Um, there was also uh, grants secured to update the Statlium Cultural Center feasibility. Uh, that's been shared with uh, the Lillooet Tribal Council chiefs. And uh, I believe there's a meeting February 4th, uh, again with LTC to discuss some next steps uh, and so hopefully there will be some uh, further progress around that. The, um, the recommended approach in the feasibility study was, as I believe you know, uh, a fully integrated renovation of the rec center on Main Street. So a really iconic central statement that um, we, we are in this community together. Uh, so uh, it, it's, uh, it's an ambitious undertaking uh, but, you know, the, I believe the, the willingness to explore it uh, in a sort of new form of partnership and uh, governance structure hopefully will be there. So um, progress on that front. Uh, I was also happy to support Lillooet Tribal Council and Hoiston on a recent grant application for a building on Main Street uh, where um, they hope to, uh, to have some more services for uh, community members. And then um, I did mention the resident survey. So that'll be presented the, the very detailed, well, hope not too detailed, I don't, but um, very interesting results of the survey uh, will go before council on February 8th. We could go to the next slide, please. Uh, so looking forward now, just a couple more slides. Where are we going in 2022? Um, the survey was a great tool. I would love to host some small focus groups to just confirm the vision for Lillooet's economic future. And then we move to content and coll collateral for up to three sectors um, that have been identified as priorities. And um, the, they are the ones I, I would, if you had to guess which ones they are, I believe that you would, you would not be surprised. I mean, there is a, um, a very uh, keen interest in planting our flag in you know, areas around agriculture and tourism and wellness. And so um, I'll share the details uh, with that, but uh, don't wanna hold back. It's, it's not that it's, uh, it's going to be shocking to anyone, uh, but it was very interesting to pull the community and appreciate how ready they are for this. Um, we'll continue to update the community investment profile on the district website, continue to work with the Satlium communities a very uh, interesting opportunity that we're just beginning to explore uh, sort of a Hachlip to hoist and circle tour. Uh, and of course with the district um, involved in that as well. Uh, so lots of, lots of potential. There's an active transportation grant out there right now. There is the tourism relief fund, uh, the, that grant money out there. So um, lots of, uh, lots of interest and lots of, creative ideas to add to the depth and density of the visitor experience from a tourism perspective and create reasons for longer lengths of stay rather than just a pass through. I mentioned the MRDT, we're looking at that as a possible sustainable funding model, uh, but very early days, just considering pros and cons. The range beyond range circle tour is going to continue. If we could go to the next slide. Uh, I think I shared this with you in our last session. Uh, we have new funding. Uh, we had some carryover funding from last year and then also some new funding for 2022. And we will work to include uh, more of the Statlium experiences that are open. Um, next slide. The Respect the Bridge River Valley campaign that began in March, then you'll recall was expanded to include Lillooet and Squamish. 
And so that's something else that we want to continue to promote in 2022 that, um, you know, visitors, uh, you know, we welcome visitors, but we do expect them to behave responsibly. And next slide is just, uh, again, just to remind you of what that looked like. And then the back of that was customized to each destination. So for the, the Bridge River Valley, we had, you know, get fueled, get fed, get sure get excited uh, or <laughs> forget what they were. On the back of the Lillouette one, we, we directed people to the visitor center to get more information because we just had too many businesses in Lillouette to list them all. So we thought, let's send them to the visitor center. Uh, and of course we will work in 2022 to continue to support the provision of visitor information services. If there is a, a new model uh, or uh, an evolution of that model in 2022. Those discussions are also underway with Tourism Lillooet and with the Historical Society, because of course there are some challenges with that museum building um, not being suitable uh, for pretty much anything. So um, yeah, next slide. Yeah, so uh, that's a quick overview. I really appreciate the opportunity to, to share some of those highlights and the future direction and yeah, look forward to, to hearing um, your thoughts and comments. Thank you very much, Suzanne. Um, and yes, thank you for stopping the screen sharing. So I can see that Director Jackie Rasmussen's hand is up. Good morning. I'm going to try the video thing. It's a little unstable today, me and my <laughs> internet. <laughs> Hi, Suzanne. Thanks for that update. That's awesome. I, I just wanted to ask you about a couple things. One of them was um, the funding um, for your position moving forward, which relates to a question regarding tourism, Lillooette, and those models um, going forward. To me, we I can't say enough about the fact that having somebody like yourself in that position, making these things happen is why we got so far this year. And I worry always about the fact that we had to create a new um, not for profit because we are unique and we should have our own destination management organization, but our capacity within our region to sustain that is concerning to me. So I, I wondered about different out of the box models that would work potentially under current organizations, um, you know, or, or governments, but also to, um, you know, just if we had that staff and consistency of staff, then I would be less worried about that. Um, and then, so there's that piece. And then the second part of that is where um, does Explore Gold Country fit into the scheme of things? So those are my two questions. Thanks. Um, thank you, Jackie. Um, so to the first point, I mean, that exactly, that's exactly why we're looking at this um, creating, rather than being, part of a very large regional catchment uh, within the triple, the Caribou Chilcotin Coast Tourism Association, where they collect the 3% MRDT all the way, we're at the Southern end in area A in the district of Lillooet, and they go all the way up to Williams Lake, Barkerville and across to Bella Coola, right? It's a massive region. And, you know, I don't want to imply that they're doing a bad job, but it's a massive region, right? And they're focused, they have some iconics like the Great Bear Rainforest and the Gold Rush Trail, which, you know, we see some benefit, but the question was on the table, would we see more benefit if we were the recipient? And I say we, the, the royal we, uh, it would likely be a, a new entity uh, that, but recognizing that if we, were, if we were just to do District of Lillooet, we'd be too small to accomplish anything. If we were just to do Village of Pemberton Area C, you know, they're kind of small to do anything on their own. Area A is too, so that's why we thought, okay, well, what if we looked at, at just taking the entire Southern catchment, ABC, District of Lillooet, Village of Pemberton, they don't currently collect MRDT in the Village of Pemberton or Area C. So it would be new for them. It would be hiving off um, the 3% that's collected for Area A in the District of Lillooet. And I mean, I say Area B, but I don't think there's eligible accommodation in Area B right now. Maybe there would be in some future scenario. And that kind of creates the scope and scale to say, okay, we would collect enough destination marketing funds to hire someone that's, that's, and, and that is focused on 
tourism. They would become the, uh, they would have to report to, you know, they, they would be accountable to the entirety of the area. So it wouldn't be a tourism Lillooet position or a tourism Pemberton position. It would be, um, you know, we'd have to have a governance model that had fair and equitable representation geographically, as well as across the business sectors. But it's, it's absolutely doable. And I've assisted, uh, we just did something similar for the entirety of the Columbia Valley. So they, they had Radium and Invermere and Fairmont and all kind of doing separate things. And now there's a Columbia Valley DMO. So um, I think that would be, that would allow us to have more direct say over the investments that are made and allow us to staff that position. And then the economic development position, um, you know, is still funded through the NDIT grant. So the District of Lillooet applies for that grant to NDIT, as does the SLRD. And then I believe the SLRD's money is split between area A and area B. So that's how we can kind of juggle those resources. And then gold country, um, you know, again, gold country does good work, but it's, it's in, in my opinion, it's in a very narrow lane around uh, gold rush trail and geocaching. And, you know, and geocaching is a, it's a very interesting segment and certainly we can benefit from it. Um, so, you know, if we can be, if we can work with them in partnership and, you know, be on their website and be in some of their collateral, um, I think that's great. Um, I would maybe question if, if that's being offered for free. Um, but if it, if it starts to be offered for a fee, then I think we have to start looking at return on investment. And is that the wisest use of funds versus investing in our own website or you know, trying to get our own social channels more active? Okay, that's great. Thank you. Those were a lot. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I see Sal's hand and also Barb's and maybe we'll end there so that Suzanne can get that little guy that's helping everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Sal, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Suzanne, you know, in your presentation, uh, it looked like forestry didn't participate. Yeah, I'm just, it's... I'm just wondering who you reached out to and, and uh, why they didn't participate. Uh, we reached out to four or five folks um, and we continue to invite them. Um, but yeah, there just hasn't been a lot of take up. Now, you know, that said, I educate myself, you know, through conversations with folks, even though they're not officially participating on the committee. Um, but yeah, there were uh, four or five different individuals that were suggested by the committee members over the course of the sort of the committee's life. Um, and uh, that they just don't seem to uh, make it a priority to join the committee meetings. Okay, the other question I've got uh, is on the, uh, you know, recreate responsibly program that uh, that a number of communities are using now. We have, I really haven't heard anything from Destination BC, of all that funding that they were going to get. And that's why the BRBCA said, okay, you guys are going to be way too late and we're going to do it on our own, which they started. And and you know it, it was very successful. There's no ends ifs or buts of that program. But what's the latest from Destination BC on? Uh, I think it was three hundred, yep, something million dollars or three hundred. Oh, sorry, no, well, three hundred thousand. Yeah, a decent amount of money. Yeah, you're yeah. absolutely right, Sal. They um, so they have what they're calling it's the Sea to Sky Visitor Education Initiative, and um. They're still in study and design mode, uh, of, unfortunately, which was our challenge previously. We needed to activate something in advance of summer 2021 because we knew we were going to be inundated. They took 2021 and you know, I don't, they're working hard. Let, I will say that, but they are working slower than <clears throat> our reality requires. <clears throat> so in 2021, they engaged Origin Design, a graphic design firm, to create um, a campaign and imagery. And 
um, what they came up with and recommended, they took it back to sort of this, the tourism industry that's participating in this. A lot of people have kind of dropped off and, and lost interest because of the pace, but those that continue to participate, um, some of them found the campaign vaguely offensive, actually. It was a, a bit insulting to visitors. And so they thought they were ready to launch this campaign and they had to go back to the drawing board. Uh, and so now, actually just next week, they have some new creative that they're testing, I believe. So I've only, I've been monitoring it um, just from the sidelines because um, I don't think they wanted to hear our level of frustration at the table, but <laughs> that's where that's at. Um, if the new, if the new okay. creative is good, then perhaps there'll be something for summer 2022. So um, this question will go to um, Ms. Westerholm. So Patricia, is, is there a possibility to have Destination BC come to the board and do a presentation on where they're at? Thanks, Director DeMera, through the chair. Um, yes, that is definitely um, an option. And um, we have discussed that at uh, various times over the course of this work that's been done over the past um, year and a bit. Um, and um, Suzanne is correct. The, uh, I, my understanding is that they will be coming back to the um, Destination Management uh, Council um, table um, with the latest um, version of the um, sort of that visual piece of the education um, project, visitor education project um, in the coming uh, in the next month or so, I think. So um, probably would make sense to have, to invite them to uh, maybe share with the board um, after that presentation. Um, but yeah, it's definitely been discussed um, a few times. So that that can def that can certainly happen for sure. Okay, thank you. Thanks. That's all. And so, thank you. So we might put that on the bring forward list for, for this committee as well. But we do already have a couple of delegations for the next meeting, so. Okay, one more question from Barb. Uh, Weep, where are you? Yes, your son looks like hey, there you are. patient, Suzanne. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was, the timing was such that if I took him before the meeting, I might've been late for you guys and then. <laughs> anyway, Not sure I was ever that eager to go to school. Um, <laughs> Quiet, I'm, please. I appreciate Jackie asking the question about Explore Goal Country as I'm the council representative on that board. So, and, but I was a little displeased with your answer as to- Okay, fair enough. Yeah. Um, you know, all they have going is, uh, geocaching is a, a big tourism grab mm -hmm. all around the world. Plus they are, advancing out they're doing videos and all kinds of things of the various different areas so yeah when I, I started to get included in the emails I was like okay they're not dealing with explore gold country at all and I would really like to see someone reach out to at least have a conversation and try to include that part um for us that that they are a big driver for Lillooet maybe not so much for Pemberton or, and I get the Caribou Chicolton and the Sea to Sky. And I always feel like we are the tail end of everything. So if that could happen, I'd really appreciate it. Absolutely. Yeah, I, um, I can reach out to them and um, they've had a number of staff changes too. So um, hopefully their staff are also reaching out to stakeholders. Hey, thank you. Um, I would like to just thank you, Suzanne, and let you go. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much, everyone. <laughs> thanks Pleasure so much for this here. presentation today. Very helpful. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. The next item on our agenda, Jackie, your hands up. Did you mean for it to be up? Yeah, I just wanted to make a quick comment um, to support um, Councillor Weeb because I work quite closely with Gold Country and my other position. And I found them to be um, organized, a really great 
representative board. Um, and there's a lot of networking that goes on between um, Gold Country, Explore Gold Country and CCCTA and others. And so I, I think that um, it's a good idea what she said to for Suzanne to reach out because it may on the outside look very narrow, but it's really not. It's got it's it's dovetailing in a lot of different programs and and very well connected. So I just wanted to give a shout out to them for sure. I hear you. And so are we leaving it in terms of an action that the Destination BC will be invited to present to the SLRD board. That's what you were asking for, Sal, right? And that's what Patricia was talking about? Okay. Um, our next item is the consent agenda, item four, which is just confirmation and receipt of minutes. I need a motion to accept. Thank you. Moved by Director Vermeer, seconded by Director Weave. For the consent agenda, anyone opposed? Motion carried. Business arising from the minutes. I don't have any, does anyone have business? Okay. So number six is staff reports and other businesses. Other business. All right, we're looking at the meeting calendar. So I will turn it over to staff. <laughs> I'm not sure who, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. The report was drafted by uh, Ms. Clark, but uh, I can speak to it if there are any questions. We did have to make some changes with the hope that we would be able to have those meetings, the physical component occur in Lillooet rather than in Pemberton to better support any members of the public that might want to attend in person. Um, to do that, we had to make sure it was on a different date than the Pemberton Valley Utilities and Services Committee, which also holds their meetings typically on the same day. And uh, they've already adopted their calendar. So um, that's why you'll see these dates are a little bit different than maybe what you've historically seen. It does include a January date, so that hopefully that will carry us through to um, and give us at least the date for our first meeting of next year so that the calendar can go forward to the January 19th date, assuming that those dates are agreeable to the committee. We have put the March meeting as continuing to be uh, the physical location in Pemberton um, because we've had some additional glitches with uh, the the technical side of things, as well as because we're still seeing quite a high level of cases with the current variant of COVID-19 and not, not wanting to uh, encourage too much gathering to give people that physical distancing to the greatest extent possible. So that one is scheduled to be at 9 a.m. in Pemberton. And so then we've just suggested at this point that we leave the start time and meeting locations open to be determined in coordination with the chair prior to the meeting so that we can be responsive to what's going on both with COVID-19 and if there were any road closures and those types of considerations that we would have to be um, able to respond to. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Are there any questions for CAO Helmer? Yes, Director Weed. When you say the location will be Pemberton, <laughs> I'm, is that that some will be in the boardroom and we will be on Zoom? Or are we to be in Pemberton for nine o'clock? <laughs> uh, through the chair, thank you. Yes. Uh, to clarify a good question. The intent is that now under the current legislation, we are required to have an ability for the public to hear or watch in here in person if they want to. I expect that nobody will avail of th themselves of that opportunity unless they happen to be in the Pemberton vicinity, um, which is why we would prefer to be able to support uh, a different start time and location if that proves to be possible. Um, yeah, so we're not expecting uh, any of the, the committee members um, to attend, but we will make sure that there's a staff member that does physically attend in Pemberton in March in order to support that uh, legislative requirement.
Is everyone uh, following this? Are you good with the dates as proposed? I mean, District of Lillooet certainly has a nice hybrid model going with um, the meetings being filmed and they are, I think, live on, on YouTube, but people can't ask questions or anything, but they can attend in person anyway. We're all learning as we go how best to do this. But this meets the legislative and democratic requirements at this point in time. So I need a motion to approve, move by Director Gaber, seconded by Director Weeb to move the meetings, approve the recommendation as presented. Uh, anyone opposed to that? Okay, thank you. The next report, 6.2, would staff like to speak to it or is it just a matter for the committee to discuss um, the, the main issue as to whether or not we keep our alternate directors on the committee for the, for the next year, the fourth year of my term, Director the Mayor's term, <laughs> Barb's term, et cetera. But yeah. Um, just uh, yeah, thank you, Chair. Yes. There's not a whole lot to say other than that was placed on the agenda because uh, in the fall, the committee did say they, they were interested in seeing what that uh, document said and having a discussion around uh, what the preference of the committee would be moving forward. Committee members have comments? Yes, please go ahead, Barb. Um, I like having our alternates here. That way, if one of us can't make it, at least they're up to date and know what's going on. I think there's nothing worse than having an alternate thrown in that hasn't been at any of the meetings and they're just sitting there going, okay, this is fun. Hope they have donuts. So <laughs> yeah, I like having the alternates on. I really appreciate having the extra voices and, and uh, the input from every member of this committee. So I would like to keep the alternates, but it is uh, open for any other comments or considerations. Director Dumer. Yeah, I'm in agreement also. Okay, so in that case, we need a uh, motion to receive the report for information. Moved by Director Weeb, seconded by Director DeMair. Anyone opposed? Motion carried. And... <laughs> The next item on the agenda, pages 43 to 374, <laughs> your package. When I started downloading that and saw how many bytes of information it was, I was absolutely horrified. Of course, this is, <laughs> this is from the hub mainly, and it's just packed with pictures and graphs and wonderful stuff and more pictures and yes. Um, okay, there's a couple of things on there. Are we inviting anyone in to, is Jeanette joining us, Melanie, or anyone else? Uh, yes, she is, Chair. So we have uh, Ms. Lester Holm here already, and I'm admitting uh, Ms. Nadon to uh, join us as well. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Jeanette, Nadon, and if you'd like to give us the highlights of pages 43 to 374, <laughs> I'd be grateful. And it's all really good stuff. Thank you. Uh, yes, good morning, uh, everybody. Jeanette Naden, Communications and Engagement Consultant for the SLRD, reporting on the 2021 Economic Development Capacity Building Grant Projects um, that were, uh, as we know, we had allocated $25,000 uh, each to electoral areas A and B 
to undertake uh, specific economic development capacity building work. In area A, uh, we allocated the funds to the Bridge River Valley Community Association, who used the $25,000 to hire an economic development contractor, Suzanne Denbach, to undertake uh, several priorities for electoral area A. So uh, her final report is attached, <coughs> excuse me. And in my information report, I just touched on um, some of the sort of high level deliverables that, uh, that she worked on. And she did make a presentation to NEDIC uh, late last year. So I believe that the committee should be up to date on, on her work, but um, the gist of it is her focus was strengthening collaboration and partnerships with Statlium communities, uh, tourism sector and BC Hydro, um, pursuing activation of an affordable housing project. So there's quite a bit of information in, in the final BRBCA report about the work on that housing project um, uh, and recommendations for next steps. Um, and she did a resident uh, sentiment survey as well and was continuing to support some tourism marketing initiatives, which she actually touched on in her, in her uh, presentation earlier this morning as well, as it related to uh, District of Lillooet as well. So um, just to summarize, the $25,000 was for her uh, contract fees. And so everything um, in the report looks to be eligible for the NDIT grant, and I'll be submitting a report uh, before the end of this month to that effect. Uh, electoral area B, um, we used the $25,000 to contract to Lillooet Learning Community Society to undertake a pilot project for the uh, Community Connect Hub. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a really long report. And again, Kim North did a presentation to NEDIC at the end of last year. So I, I believe that that uh, report offered a pretty good summary of all the work that she had undertaken um, in 2021, um, but the report that's attached to my information report includes uh, a summary of all the research uh, that had been undertaken through the year, all of her efforts to uh, engage various other nonprofits and Statlium communities into um, the work. Uh, there's a, an updated community capacity assessment, which actually is quite an interesting document. She, she started with the template that we had developed in 2014 for the community asset inventory. And then um, District of Lillooet had done some similar work. So she sort of amalgamated it into one document. Um, there is a recommendation in the report that we work with a, um, one organization, an umbrella organization to keep that community capacity assessment updated. Uh, and maybe to update it once every four years when the new census comes out. Um, she did some work with uh, a business model canvas. So to try and determine uh, what, how, how we can make the hub sustainable into the future um, and whether it would be um, sort of like a continue to have a little it learns be the umbrella for the hub or whether it becomes its own standalone not-for-profit or whether it becomes a community contribution company. There's been some preliminary work done on that, but the hope for, uh, for this year, they're hoping that they can actually spend a little bit more time on some strategic planning workshops to come up with uh, an actual organizational structure that, that makes sense. Um, and so the, yeah, the final re the report does include some key learnings as well. And uh, I don't actually have those um, at the top of my head, but I can flip to them if you would like me to go over them. Um, but like I said, it, uh, I have double checked all of the work that was done and it does all appear to be eligible under the terms of the grant. So I'll be completing the um, NDIT final report within the next couple of weeks and submitting it in time for the deadline. And then next steps will be for the area A and B directors. Um, I'm hoping to meet with both of you either together or separately to uh, ascertain your, um, how you would like to proceed for 2022. The grant application to NDIT is due on uh, March 31st. So we do have a little bit of time. 
uh, but we will require a board directive to proceed with that. So um, I, I see that the, there is going to be a March 17th meeting for NETIC. So uh, perhaps we can have a discussion at that time about next steps, uh, or we can just meet offline. And then I would be submitting a report to the board uh, for direction to proceed with that grant application. Um, we do have a letter on file from the BRBCA that's requesting uh, that we do continue to allocate the area A share of the grant to them, but we haven't yet received a work plan from them. So that's why that request isn't on this report. Um, I, I believe that their meeting, I think it was either yesterday or tomorrow, the Economic Development Committee is meeting to finalize that work plan. So we should be receiving it soon. And I'm hoping to schedule a meeting with Kim North and Toby Mueller from Lillowit Learns to talk about their uh, aspirations for 2022 as well. Um, and I think that's it for me. I will uh, leave it open for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and also, Jeanette, I really appreciate the extra um, sort of nurturing and outreach and support you've provided for the hub as it's been a pretty tough year to say the least. And uh, they persisted. Um, I have a few small comments from the report, but first I'd just like to open it up to questions from the rest of the committee. And I'm not seeing any hands pop up. Okay. Um, first of all, in terms of this having been a proof of concept in this first year, I think it was an absolute success. Um, as Area B, I'm certainly in favor of continuing it and supporting it. Hopefully next year will be a more typical year with less massive, fewer massive disasters would be good. <laughs> um, when I, I, let me just make sure I understand combining I saw the reference to combining the SLRD and the District of Lillooet documents in terms of uh, economic development, the, the overall picture. And is that something that we're planning to do early in this year? Who's doing that work or is that something that we're asking to do? Thank you. Yeah, so my understanding, um, in speaking with Kim about it is that um, the work, the community capacity assessment that was uh, completed at the end of 2021 mm -hmm. um, is sort of contains the most up-to-date information. So I don't think she's looking at updating that again in 2022, um, but it's just a matter of, of coming up with a, a strategy so that we know that that document will be um, updated sort of on an as need basis. And what she had recommended was that it be done at least every four years when the when the Canada census information comes out so that, it, um, but it, I mean, we, it could be updated more regularly than that as well. But um, yeah, it's a pretty, it's a pretty useful document. Um, and uh, yeah, she just wants to make sure that it's continuing to be used and to be updated and useful. Thank you, and sorry, that's sort of what you said before. I, I, I just had to hear it twice. <laughs> okay. Um, on page 180, I think uh, it's page 25 of the report, it talks about a census being done. Okay, I have to find it. Oh, first of all, the, the, um, there's also a, the date needs to be updated on the cover page of the report. Okay. But this was, I'm trying to find this typo. Ah, yes. On page 180, page 25 of the report, there's a reference to the, cent to the census in <laughs> 1916. And I thought, I suspect that's a mistake. <laughs> Sorry, which page is that? I'll just make a note of it. 
uh, of the report, it's page 25. Um, of your report, it's page 138. And <laughs> in our package, it's page 180. Great, thanks. Yeah, actually, I, I do recall uh, catching that one myself and uh, and I, she must not have uh, made that change. So I'll make sure that that gets changed as well. Thank you. And I see, move this down. On page 182, um, the hub financials. Now, I've heard lots about this from Kim and the crew at the hub, and I think it's absolutely excellent news. They made, um, I mean, we're talking small amounts of money, but still, this, is, this, this counts. This was a profitable sort of year, and they certainly made more money than they thought they were going to, and um, they think they can do considerably better in the future. So I thought that was very good to see, particularly given this, this tough year. And uh, I see there are some assumptions moving forward that we will continue to provide support. And that's certainly my intention anyway, as area B. So maybe that's all I'll say about that. Yes, go ahead, Jeanette. I just wanted to point out on the, um, the recommendations from the hub report, um, and I do see there's a typo on that page as well. It says the short-term goals for 2023, and that should actually be 2022. Um, so number, which one is it here? Number three, it does say explore opportunities to again, partner with the SLRD for a 2022 NDIT economic development capacity building grant. And I just wanted to flag that. Um, so it is something that we're, we're expecting to receive from the hub. Um, and I have uh, talked briefly with Kim about this, but we just have to be very careful. The, the economic development capacity building funding is quite specific to economic development capacity building. And so a lot of the work that the hub is doing is um, community development, but not necessarily community economic development. Um, so uh, we, we were awarded the funding for 2021 as a proof of concept. Um, and so some of the costs that were incurred in that year uh, were considered eligible because it was a pilot, but um, may not be considered eligible moving forward if they become operational expenses. So that's something that we have to keep in mind. And, um, you know, I think what I would like to do is to meet with Kim and, and Toby and find out what are the projects that you're looking at doing in 2022 to advance uh, the pilot and to make it, you know, to come up with a sustainable model for it. Um, and then sort of determine which of those are going to be related to building capacity for economic development and then focusing our 25,000 on that if that's the direction that we decide to go. Uh, but it is just something to be aware of because um, she's got a lot of really good ideas, but they're not necessarily all eligible for this particular pot of money. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I appreciate that. Um, and Sal, please go ahead. Yes, the BRVCA Economic Development Committee meeting was yesterday, last evening, and I attended it. And uh, they actually... Um, went through their the work plan, approved it. Plus they also uh, did a priority of each one of the um, projects that they're looking at. So they're all prioritized also. So it, it should be coming shortly. Thank you. Ms. Rasmussen? Uh, I just wanted to uh, make a comment or a request of Jeanette, when um, when you're having those conversations with Kim and Toby, that um, I it, I'm trying to flaring this on the fly, but I totally understand and hear what you're saying about the the netic and the economic development specific, like that it has to be specific to that funding. Um, who did we lose? No, you're still there. Okay, <laughs> um, and but the one of the main drivers of having this hub is to support 
the not-for-profit and um, economic development in our community, which are completely linked. And I, and I know you, you know this, but I think the thing that probably needs to really be a strong message is that um, while there's a really long list of what could be done with the hub, that we should probably put those economic things at the top of the list, in my opinion, and the sustainability piece so that we can continue making sure that the hub is creating those economic um, you know, uh, opportunities. Oh, and my internet's gone. All right, can you still hear me? It's gone, tells me it's unstable. Um, and that as that builds and is there's more sustainability and the economic drivers are creating the, the other opportunities to do the other things on the list that are more in my mind than nice to do things. Yeah, I, Patricia's nodding her head too. I think you guys know what I mean. So it, in my um, experience, we want to do it all. And especially with this um, amazing hub that's uh, being done. But if we have specific funding, we wanna really take advantage of it to ensure that this hub continues. Cause I'm, I can't say enough good things about this, the, the model and, and I'm excited about how this is supporting our community and our region. Very well said, thank you, Jackie. I'm with you. Yes, Director Wee. Yes, that was along the line where I was going to go. So thank you, Jackie, you put it way more tactfully than what my mind was thinking. <laughs> And Jeanette, that was a, a really thorough report and very well done. I, I will say I thought I was going into a committee of the whole at the SLRD when I saw the number of pages as well. And I'm on another note, I'm really glad to see you back and that you're just easing in at your own speed. Um, you've been thoroughly missed and you're a great asset. So thank you. Thank you, Barb. And just one other comment that um, for all the lip service going on for reconciliation, just everywhere all the time right now, I'm just so impressed with what the hub's been able to do in, in real terms for reconciliation. I'm thrilled. I've been able to participate, um, going to the opening, going to the graduation of the ambassadors and more hearing and reading about the two sessions where Shelley Leach and Colleen from Hacklip came in and, and it's, I just, I hear a lot from Kim when we're going for walks together and it's just amazing, good stuff. And so that is hard to capture in a report, but you know, as long as it is, and never mind me squeaking about the number of megabytes or whatever, it's just like, she does capture it fairly well in the report, which is impressive. And so I, I thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Patricia and Jeanette both, because I know you had to help quite a bit to kind of keep that steering in the right direction. And it's definitely going in the right direction. So a motion to receive the report. And is that it? Is that enough direction from us? Yes, thank you, Chair. That's that's good for the moment, and staff will bring back another report once the uh, application details have been received and reviewed. Thank you. I'll make the motion to accept receipt of the information. And I'll second that um, with great appreciation. Anyone opposed? Motion carried. Thank you very much. And our next item, we're doing actually amazingly well for time here, 2211. Do you guys want five minutes? How are you feeling? You're okay? 
Okay. I'm still I'm still happening here. I haven't gone into complete Zoom zombie brain, so I'm okay if we carry on. And in that case, the next item is the round table discussion. And of course, we would start at area A and our vice chair, Sal Demare. Thank you, Director Birch Jones. The as you can see, the picture in behind me, Winterfest, it's uh, the planning is going along really well. And uh, the rinks are looking pretty good. So looks like it's going to be a go. And we got volunteers, lots of volunteers for the day of the event. So it's uh, very positive for our community so that the people can get back together again, get at least that format. So I'm very pleased with that. And uh, I did have a discussion with uh, uh, Sabrina Laraki uh, yesterday, and they will be doing a presentation, a uh, public meeting for the Area A. It may be open to um, other communities also. So a little public uh, presentation on what their final um, you pick is for the uh, for the um, seismic issues that they've got on LaJoy Dam. So depending on which of the four um, the projects that they were looking at that they pick, it could definitely be an economic boom for our community because it'll be, you know, two, three year project. It's the biggest project of all the projects that they're doing of the uh, upgrades that they're doing to the Bridge River system that they have. So I know the we talked about it at the Economic Development Committee meeting yesterday. So everybody's looking forward to this. And we'll definitely make sure that there's as many people uh, interested that will able to view the uh, online meeting, public meeting. And that's all I have. Thank you. Hey, good job, Sal. Also, um, congratulations on all the work and the way you guys survive weather, road, power cut, internet services cut. I know you were right out there helping with all the other frontline people in the neighborhood. Um, good on you. Karen, did you want to add anything to Director DeMare's? No, I don't have anything to add. Thank you. Um, Barb and Lori, District of Lillooet. Lori do, you, huh? Lori, do you want to go first? Because I know you have to leave sooner than later. So sure. That would be great. Carry so, on. Um, first of all, I did not realize that my hide self view was not working. My apologies for stretching, etc. Nobody needs to witness that. So thanks, Barb, for the heads up. Um, <laughs> So uh, what I've been working on is, and I know it came up to the SLRD on the agenda. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about my petition, you know, uh, and I thank you for at least considering it. Uh, 2021 was a horrific year for BC fires, as we all know, letting aside because I don't think anything, anybody would have been able to stop what happened in Lytton. There's just no time. Um, but I wrote a petition asking the federal and provincial governments to re-examine the policies and procedures that are currently in place for, for forest firefighting. And basically what that petition was saying was, you know, Ontario has an all hazards agency. So instead of having a different person working in fire protection, one working in floods, one working on slides, they're training people to work in all three thereby giving year round work too. Um, and uh, there was a few other recommendations there and including like using the resources and knowledge of the people affected. So those, those on the ground, such as, you know, the firefighters, the forestry workers, farmers, First Nations, if we don't have the resources to protect BC forests, 
then we need a backup plan. And what is it? Is it training the farmers? I know that First Nations, at least around Willowet, are being trained. So let's keep going with that and let's find more resources. So I was inspired to write this petition based on two videos. And the videos are a Valley Destroyed, the, the story of Monte Creek and Paxton Valley 2021. And if you haven't watched those videos, I ask that you please do, even the first one only. They're 28 minutes long. And uh, I, I think that if you watch just one of them the whole way through, I think you will, you'll join me in this. So those people spotted the fires, called the number, the 5511 number. They were told not to try and put out the fire themselves because help was on the way. You can't be under the bombers when they're dropping waters, obviously. So uh, the farmers, residents were told to stay out of the bush. The bombers never came and nobody did. It was their fight alone. And this video is so powerful that it made me want to be a part of the change that is so desperately needed in BC. And I think if we don't change our procedures, at least the ones that are not working, we will continue to lose BC forests. And uh, so I'm, I'm in it and I will continue to work for, for something better. Um, Brad Vist was supposed to take this to the House of Commons this month, but I think due to the trucker um, rally that's going on, I think it will probably be delayed or at least I'm expecting it to be delayed. Uh, he's not back in the House of Commons until just this week, so I'm just waiting to have another meeting with him to find out, you know, what's happening with that. So I did contact Jackie Taggart, and Jackie Taggart is is in it to to um, kind of collaborate and see what's not working and you know, be proactive in the change too. So I just wanted to kind of update you and thank the LCLRD for considering it. it the, the petition is getting traction and I am getting comments from other communities. So it's, it's, I'm really grateful for that. And that's it for me. Thanks. Thank you. So Barb, proceed. Well, what would you like to know? <laughs> Everybody from the report on the hub knows how busy it's been in Lillooet. So, and I feel like I'm talking to the SLRD board and everybody's already heard this about our fiber optics coming to town. It's created a little bit of havoc. And we've learned a little bit about how road maintenance works that they can dig it up whenever they want. So it's kind of a blessing that we didn't get the grant to do Russell Street. <laughs> Otherwise, they'd be digging up our new pavement. Um, I am running for uh, director at large again on the Silga board. So anybody who's able to vote, please vote Weeb. <laughs> Weebles wobble, but they don't fall down. So we'll carry on with that one. Um, we kind of came up with a slogan. You know, I don't know if it'll help Councillor Hopful or not, but it was burnt out, flooded out left out and I think that's how a lot of the smaller communities feel like even when funding comes through probably a larger portion will go to Abbotsford and I get populations and seriousness and all of those things but if you could do the highway to get it open in x number of months I, it, it just devastates me what is going on in Lytton and I just found out yesterday from my husband that now they are finally doing some cleanup over there. I think they are taking um, two bins a day over to Cash Creek landfill to be disposed of. So that's at least something is happening. Uh, what else? On our coming up council meeting on February 8th, we are to have a delegation from Interior Health. That should be interesting. I'm not sure if we'll leave there a little glazed over and know any more about what's going on with our clinic and our hospital and the people in it and the people that work. I'm um, really looking forward to asking the question if they have anybody on administration that actually worked in healthcare at any point in time um, to actually get that feeling down to what the patients need 
what the nurses need, what the doctors need. I'm, I really feel that the administrative part of who's making the rules doesn't really have the full picture of what we as patients need. Um, our swimming pool is open due to our great fundraisers and they have some fantastic programs and a little tidbit of information that nobody on this screen wants to know. I have actually ordered two swimsuits online to try an Aquafit class. So I also ordered snow boots. So we'll see which comes first. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you, Barb. And yeah, the pool is hopping. I've been to a couple of Aquafit classes and it's, yeah. And there's all the kids there doing the swimming and so on. Um, the challenge is to keep it going. Uh, all right. So let's see. The pool is something I was thinking of. I, I think the swims board will probably need more support. And recently I just tried to help them out with, with some funds towards helping them accumulate the data that they need to make the applications, for example, to the gaming grant and so on. This, you know, this is not something that can just be left to volunteers, but um, it's amazing what they've done. Lillooet Agriculture and Food is going to present to us at our next meeting because they'll do, Sarah will do a report for the fiscal year end and also make a bit of a plan for the upcoming year. It's also an organization that we support from the SLRD through payment in lieu of taxes. And they are hiring a new executive director, um, but I, I don't think that's accomplished yet. Sarah's leaving. Um, Our grant writer that Sal and I share, Lori Reimer, she's really, she did her year-end report and she accomplished a lot. Um, not that we got all the grants that we applied for, but each time uh, I think we're getting closer and we hope to keep her on again. And as she gets to know the different groups and the funding agencies, I think her work gets more targeted. Um, probably the big decision I made in terms of funding most recently was to assist ELRIS with some work. I mean, rehabilitation and restoration work after these fires for me is like at the top of the list of priorities. And so Jackie, I'll maybe ask you to speak a little bit about what ELRIS will be doing. Um, and the fact that we have regular meetings with Flinro and the First Nations and ours is there and I'm there when I can be uh, is very good. And oh, Interior Health. Uh, thank you, Barb. I have written down February 8th. I know that um, Jeff at the lab has taken an administrative position and uh, Chris Dreyer has stepped in for the health planning table in the wake of Bev Grosser leaving. So those are two very knowledgeable and capable people to represent us. I'm really glad for, for both and that both of them are local matters a lot at this point in time. And yeah, I'll stop there for now. Thank you, Jackie, over to you. Thanks. Uh, I, I'll just segue right into the, the McKay Creek fire restoration um, so Alvis was invited to the table to speak about um, seed and um, seed mixes and things, and then it morphed into more, um, you know, more conversations that are inclusive of um, guardianship programs within the Stellium. Um, and this is a other than the emergency training that I'm involved in with uh, Darren Oiki at the lead, um, as well as. Um, Denise Bob, the, the movement of this particular um, re rehabilitation effort is probably one of the most inclusive I've seen um, in, in quite a few years in this region. Um, so at the table right now, we're working with um, 
BC, yeah, Cascades Natural Resource District um, who are leading the rehabilitation uh, on the ground. Uh, but we are what is being modeled after is what happened over in Elephant Hill, which is now a specific not-for-profit led by Bonaparte, but also inclusive of um, three to four years of monitoring with building capacity within First Nations. So Squila was involved in that, um, Bonaparte and UBC uh, Forestry. So we're trying as much as possible to model um, the efforts that and all the good work that happened over there. We're modeling that over here, as well as really sending a strong message to leadership at the LTC, like Northern Stadlium Chiefs, that there's a lot of really good ideas and, and wishes on the wish list of what wants, what needs to be done or what that technical group wants to do on the ground. Um, but the leadership um, needs to give some, some priorities. So we're, we're working on that and that's, that model is moving forward um, nicely. And uh, yeah, so I can, we continue to be at the table and we work really closely with Lillooet Tribal Council and hoping that a lot of that um, work will be that uh, collaborative and involved as many of the, um, the communities that have capacity and can build capacity. So that's the McKay Creek fire. Like we have meetings at least every two weeks. It's like McKay Creek planning, McKay Creek fire. And so that's really exciting that that's happening. The other thing I wanted to point out too, which um, is really great is that the Chamber of Commerce has become very active recently. Um, and due to the Buy Lillooet, um, or at least, sorry, shop local funding that they received, and they've hired a new executive director who I am super impressed with. His name is Johannes. Um, and so I've been in touch already with him, but also um, participating on those monthly meetings and this program, and he comes with experience. So he comes from Squamish and worked in the Squamish uh, Chamber of Commerce. So he's, and he's just connecting like crazy with people. So I've talked to him about potential opportunities or just even how to work with the Stadlium based on some of the connections that I have. Um, and so the other, the last thing I want to point out um, that's neat for as an economic driver and neat for our community is the, the project called Lillooet Wild. That's a project that's a collaboration between the Lillooet Brewing Company and the Lillooet Naturalists and something that the Invasive Species Society is now jumping on board to um, try to promote because we also have funds from the federal government to uh, promote species at risk. But how this all ties in with economic development is the fact that this particular business has an environmental ethic and they are um, using that leverage and, and bringing people to understand more about our region and how special it is and then being able to conserve and um, treat it well. So it just goes to show that we've got this, these neat new businesses happening and then, then the combination of how uh, the not-for-profit world and the, the basically the natural assets upon which tourism is based, we, we're trying to protect those going forward so that we have that as part of our, um, our economy into the future. So that's all for me. Thank you. And the, the Lillooet Wild um, campaign project and, and what the brewery is doing and, and I'm involved with the naturalists and we've been the recipient actually of an NDIT grant to help promote some of the species that not educate about some of the species at risk and the habitat that they need. So those things are all connecting rather nicely and Johannes is definitely a bonus. I'm glad you're reaching out and helping him with some of the networking, Jackie. Thank you very much. And I'm really pleased with the work that's potentially happening around the McKay fire recovery. I watched that film, the video from Forest Foods, which was one of the presenters at one of the McKay Creek wildfire recovery meetings. And I was so impressed. And that was part of the partnership with Bonaparte from Elephant Hill. And so good if, if we can get on a similar path. That was very good work. Thank you. 
Um, do we have late business from anyone? Okay. Notice of motion. Seeing nothing. La la, we're going to adjourn in time for Lori to have a decent break before her next meeting. <laughs> and I know what that's like. You need a good break. Um, anything else, you guys? Motion to adjourn. Yeah, I knew Director DeMayer would do that. Thank you, Vice Chair. <laughs> okay, all in favor? Opposed? Lori, you're opposing adjournment? <laughs> We're adjourned, thank you.